assembly and they had gone out to the city and done their begging rounds and taken care of business and then they came back and had the evening the midday meal uh, and then the Buddha took his seat as did the assembly and meditation like we just did together uh, and then after some time uh, one of those who was in the gathering stood up and in the correct manner and form asked a question and the question is, um, in what way should good sons and daughters initiating Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi dwell? How should they regulate their thoughts? And he asked this question after making a statement of how wonderful it was that the Buddha had the Sangha in his awareness and in his uh, practice. So, uh, we take up the next chunk. The Buddha replied, Excellent, excellent Subhuti. As you have said, the Tathagatha is skillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas and skillful in entrusting to the Bodhisattvas. If you now listen closely, I shall explain for you in what way good sons and daughters, uh, beginning on Uttara Samyak Sambodhi mind, should thus abide and how they should regulate their thoughts. Subhuti replied, Yes, world honored one, gladly I will listen. So this is, uh, again, there's more to this than what might come out of a casual reading. Um, the student asks the question and the teacher says, Sure, I'll give an answer. But we need to really appreciate, or we, we would be well served. We don't really need to, I suppose, but it's good. It's a really good thing to actually take uh, a little bit of time and appreciate the fact that the assembly has gathered and that someone has had the courage to stand forth and make their, put their practice and their life on the line on behalf of the, everyone in the community. And in fact, on behalf of the Buddha as well. Uh, for each of us to um, not be afraid to show up is, is a big deal. And then to be able to show up in a way that actually helps to catalyze what's happening is a big deal. And there's many, many roles for that. Um, in fact, the people who are sitting there with great concentration and sincerity are contributing just as much as the one who stands up and asks the question. And in fact, just as much as the one who hears the question and responds. And yet the roles are actually different, at least in this moment. So the Buddha says, excellent, excellent. As you have said, so this is uh, this is the universe responding to you. There's a lot of levels at which these stories actually are functioning. One is the literal story of the exchange between these people, but also is uh, these in fact are uh, characters in our own drama. These are very much you. You are Subhuti, and you are Buddha. You are the whole thing. Uh, and also the universe is the whole thing. Life itself is the whole thing. 
Um, life sometimes asks us the questions, uh, often. Uh, can we actually say excellent? Uh, even when it's a difficult question. Perhaps when it's a question we really don't want to hear. Uh, perhaps when it's a statement. Uh, maybe it's not such a lovely statement. Oh, how wonderful you are. You, you have us in your awareness. That's a nice statement. That's easy to say excellent to. You're such an idiot. How could you have done that again? Excellent. Excellent <laughs> life. You life. You've called me out on my shit again. <laughs> mm. But it is excellent. It really is excellent. It's, it's just astonishing. Uh, the capacity that we really have. So here, uh, granulating down to these characters, uh, these, these folks, the Buddha said, excellent, excellent. As you said, the Tathagata is skillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas. And he's acknowledging the fact that it's true. Uh, the Buddha is aware. And the Buddha is skillful, hopefully, uh, but definitely in this case, the Tathagata is skillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas. What does it mean to be skillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas? That obviously states that it would be possible to be unskillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas, doesn't it? Oh Buddha, how wonderful, how skillfully aware of the community you are. Uh, actually, Sabuti, not. I, I'm not. I am aware of you, but not that skillfully. That's possible. Uh, very possible. It's it's not an easy thing to hold the sangha in your heart skillfully. It's actually it's rather much easier to hold the community uh, in your heart and have it rip you apart. To hold your life in your heart skillfully is actually an option. But so is to hold your life unskillfully in your heart, uh, in your mudra. And here we have a perceptive member of the Sangha, a perceptive and dutiful disciple, noticing the fact that actually, you know what? You're very skillful, and I see that. And then the Buddha says, you're right. A hard one. Uh, this, but true, it is as you say, and it's worth noticing that. It's worth noticing that in yourself, actually. Uh, perhaps you actually make it through a 15-minute chunk of your day, and you you do so well. Surprise! That's great. It's okay to acknowledge it. It's fact. It's very healthy to acknowledge it. Sometimes uh, we can be a little bit too quick to be down on ourselves and to not really appreciate the depth that actually is unfolding. Uh, the chronic, not yet. I'm such a mess, I'm such a mess, I'm such a mess. Well, we're all a mess. You're also amazing. How about that? So the Buddha says, actually, as you have said, the Tathagatha is skillfully mindful of the community, is skillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas, and is skillful in entrusting to the Bodhisattvas. And I, rose, I raised the question last time, what is it, this skillful entrusting? Uh, there's clearly some distinction here, at least in the words, between being mindful of our lives and actually entrusting our lives. Now, we have to be mindful of our lives first. You really don't have the right or the capacity or the skill to entrust anything that you're not mindful of, just to, to use Buddhist language. If I'm not really aware of my life, I cannot entrust my life to my life. This is the first requisite, to tune in to really tune in to what is actually so and to be aware of it. Now this word mindful has got some drawbacks. I mean, we, we can tend to hear that as a very Vulcan kind of thing, you know, a very 
logically, categorically aware of my life. Well, that's actually okay too, but that's not precisely what's being pointed at here. Uh, mindful also means heartful. It's heart mindful. Mind heartful? I don't know. That's part of where words are kind of weird. In Japanese, it's shin, which means heart mind. It's like the whole body. So, uh, interestingly enough, there was some big conversation about that at the um, 2011, I guess it was, um, Mahasanga Dharma Teachers Conference, where lineage holders from all these different Theravadan and Mahayana different lineages were gathered, and uh, pioneer folks all the way to, uh, you know, Gen Xers like myself. And there was a big discussion, actually, about mindfulness and, and, this, and the the pros and cons of it and the use of even the term of it. And many people were coming to say, and these are all teachers, mind you, every person in the room is a lineage holding transmitted teacher of one stripe or the next, you know, it's quite a zoo of colors there. Um, but, uh, you know, people were saying, you know, I find actually that using the word mindful leads people too much into thinking. That it means thinkful <laughs> too easily. We should say heartful. And then others are saying, no, no, don't muddy the waters. The word's actually working. It's getting traction in the culture. Don't mess it up. Just go with it. <laughs> you know, we've gotten that far. You can amend, you know, readily. So when we hear it here, uh, this, the Tathagata is skillfully mindful of the bodhisattvas and skillful in entrusting to the bodhisattvas. What we really should be hearing is heartful, bodyful, mindful, soulfully if you will, pardon the pun. It's something like that. Uh, the Tathagatha is soulfully aware of the community. That's closer, actually, I think. And skillful in entrusting to the Bodhisattvas. So you're right. And because you can see that, because the student's understanding is approved, at least to a certain degree, because the one who's coming up to ask a question has put their practice on the line, and the Buddha accepts their practice, they have the right to ask the question. Or they have the right to a certain level of a response to the question. Let's say it like that. Uh, there's plenty of times when a student will approach the teacher and it's clear that the student's level is of a certain place. And guess what the teacher's gig is to do? Is to respond in a way that's useful to that student. So that's why it's a little confusing. You know, you can study the Buddha's teaching, some four decades of conversations with different people, and you can see in some instances, in fact, the very same question put out and radically different answers. And you might, if you were a literalist type of person, might say, well, which one is right? Maybe the later version of the Buddha's answer is more correct because his understanding had grown or something. Uh, when in fact, no. The Buddha's job here is to suss out where the practitioner actually is and respond in a way that actually is helpful. That's part of what this skillfulness that the uh, disciple is pointing to is. And so in fact the Buddha here is acknowledging, uh, to unpack it a little bit, the Buddha is acknowledging the understanding of the student. It's not just pure poetry and kind of nice storytelling that the Buddha says, excellent, excellent, it is as you have said. It's saying, I approve. You're correct. The Buddha is approving the student's, the disciple's perspective and, que and statement, uh, is approving the disciple's understanding. Now for us, in, in the modern, in our, in our path, that mostly happens in Doksan, although not exclusively. And Doksan, as you know, is the private interview with the teacher. It's kind of happening all the time. And there's plenty of important moments that happen right in front of everybody. Not necessarily everybody's tuned into it, but it's happening. Uh, sometimes it's blatant. We do, uh, once in a blue moon, we'll do a Dharma combat, where uh, 
It's basically an interview in front of everybody, which is what this is. It's also what uh, was most common in the golden era of Zen, which is why we have so many really well-preserved recordings of the dialogues between the student and the teacher. You've got a hyper-literate group, everybody in the room's got two PhDs, right? And there's an encounter happening, and everybody says, oh, that's a good one, and they go away and <laughs> open up their sleeve. And, you know, it's actually really funny, because some teachers like Huang Po would say, no, don't write this down. No. Put down the damn notebook and just be here. And the students say, yes, sir. And then as soon as he's done with the talk, they all bow, leave, and <laughs> they all scribble notes, compare, check, and make sure they got it right. Uh, and thank God, so to say, that they did, because now we have really good records of the teachings of Hong Po, for example, which is a fantastic resource. Um, and in some kind of a way that's happening here. This is a public doxan, so to speak. This is an out front encounter. Now the reason we in the Zen tradition today have doksan in private, okay, it has a lot to do with the fact that in China, um, not uh, the the one the one who was acknowledged as going to be the future successor would be the one who would be called into private interview with the teacher. So, in other words, Hui Nang, you can see this in the, in the, the story of Hui Nang and the, and the sixth ancestor in, in China, when um, there's the big public uh, encounters, Dharma encounters, and so on, and then he would teach Hui Nang in private. And that was kind of common for quite a while that, you know, only the, the chosen folk would come in and have private interview. And then um, somewhere along the line that changed, thank goodness, where everyone is of that level now. Uh, there's no holding back of any opportunity for anyone in the Sangha ever. The teacher is there. The door is open. Uh, now, you do have to come. <laughs> you do have to walk through the door, but the door is open and you're, there's a standing invitation, you see. Well now here, to get back to our tale, uh, the student, the disciple, shows his understanding and the Buddha approves his understanding and then responds, if you now listen closely I'll explain. So there's a warning in there. Did you hear the warning? I approve your understanding to this point. And if you listen closely, I will explain for you. That is a big if. There's other sutra where the assembly gathers and everyone is there, and someone asks a question, and the Buddha won't respond. He just sits there. Maybe he's just expressing the noble truth and perfect, perfect embodiment, okay? But then, a certain group of disciples become disgruntled. They get grumpy, and they leave. And once they've left, the Buddha says, now I may begin. <laughs> it's true. At least it's in the sutras. That too is a teaching. Uh, when a, this skillful means is on the part of the Buddha is not meant to be a withholding or to be a punishment. It's meant to actually be useful. If we took the medicine that's appropriate for someone who's in an extreme illness and applied that same exact medicine and dose to someone who's got a very different kind of extreme illness, this would not be good. The most basic rational thought comes to the same conclusion. The medicine needs to fit the illness. Right? So it's in that same kind of a way. Part of the medicine fitting the illness is the student asking, the student's understanding being at a certain point, and then the student continuing to pay attention. That's absolutely critical. Uh, Sabuti could have gone all that way, correct 
position, time and place, and degree, correct form, sincere effort, awesome understanding, uh, at least Buddha thinks so, right? A great question. Buddha says, sure, I'll respond. And then Subhuti checks out. Stops being in the room. Even maybe when he's sitting right there. But starts to say, well, I've done my job. I've asked the question. I'll just sit back and, you know, uh, check my iPhone. The whole thing would stop. The so Buddha says, if you now listen closely, I shall explain for you. Even though your understanding is good, worthy, and true, still you must listen. This is true for you, this is true for me, this is true for all of us. Your understanding of life may be very ripe, may be very deep. You maybe have been dragged around enough and knocked around enough and noticed enough to actually fill your seat well and to, and to um, and know what that means or you're on the way. Uh, but still, no one graduates. There is no graduation. Still, if you pay attention now, I will answer. So, I shall explain for you in what way good sons and daughters launching on Uttara Samyak Sambodhi mind should thus abide, and how thus they should regulate their thoughts. Now, I unpacked a little bit last week uh, this good sons and daughters is talking about, uh, at least the way I'm understanding it right now, it's talking about how the caste system is blown away in the Sangha. It's kind of hard to get why that would be the case, but it's basically everyone is a good son and daughter in the Sangha. There are no pariah or outcasts or merchant class or ruler caste. We're just all good sons and daughters and that's it. So it's talking about um, everyone in the community. Uh, not you were born into the merchant class or so you're merchant caste and that's the end of that. No. We're all good sons and daughters. So, in what way good sons and daughters launching Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi mind? And, you know, launching is kind of a funny word. I think of the space shuttle or a boat, but I guess it works. You know, it's sort of setting out in um, Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi is talking about the mind of complete and total awakening. Not satisfied with just a little Ken show or a little cool idea or a little relief from stress or anything. Actually full, full on, all the way through and through awakening and enlightenment. So those who are launching this mind of awakening, how they should abide and how thus they should regulate their thoughts. So how they should live and how they should be and how they should be with their minds and their hearts and their bodies. And the response from Subhuti, which is absolutely critical, without which nothing else would have happened, is, yes, world honored one, Gladly, I will listen. And so for us, we need to cultivate that view. We need to cultivate that attitude, that mind. Yes, life. I will listen. I will listen. Even if it's something I desperately don't want to hear, or doesn't agree with my preconceived ideas, or isn't matching up to my fantasy of what this is all supposed to be amounting to, I will listen. I will not turn away. At that time, Venerable Subhuti was amidst the great congregation, and he rose from his seat, adjusted his robes to one shoulder, and with his right knee touched the ground, with palms joined in reverence, he addressed the Buddha. Extraordinary, world-honored one, is the Tathagata's skillful mindfulness of the Bodhisattvas and his skillful entrustment to the Bodhisattvas. World-honored one, 
in what way should good sons and good daughters initiating Anitara Samyak Sambodhi dwell? How should they regulate their thoughts? The Buddha replied, Excellent, excellent, Subhuti. And it is as you have said. The Tathagata is skillfully mindful of the Bodhisattvas and skillful in entrusting to the Bodhisattvas. If you now listen closely, I shall explain for you in what way good sons and daughters launching the Anyatara Samyak Sambodhi mind should thus abide and how thus they should regulate their thoughts. Yes, world-honored one, gladly I would listen.